pleasure to be here. I actually, I've, I've been in Oregon a long time, and I've never come down here and give a talk, so this is great. Um, I, I am a geologist by training, and I'm interested in volcanoes uh, and, and in the rocks that come out of volcanoes. And so the talk I'm going to give today is something that I developed. Uh, it was actually for a science pub in Bend, uh, where people are very interested in volcanoes, as you can imagine, um, uh, uh, about a year ago. Uh, and then since I've, I've, I've delivered it to a number of different audiences, and it seems to go down pretty well, um, I understand there's sort of a mixture of expertise here, so I'm not going to go deep into the, the, the details of the science I do, it's more, more of a big picture talk, but by all means, if you need to know more about science behind some of this, uh, let me know. And, and basically what I would do is like to address the question, and it, it's sort of my personal speculation of what will, next or, what will Oregon's next volcanic eruption look like, where, where a, a state that has a lot of volcanoes, in fact, after Hawaii, where the state that has the number two area covered by volcanic rocks. So, so we're a very volcanic state. Uh, a lot of our, our beauty and, and our resources likewise depend on volcanoes or volcanic rocks. These are all photos from the Travel Oregon uh, website. So presumably that means this is somewhere that people like to travel to, these locations. And, and the thing they have in common, they're all talking about, they're all volcanic rocks of various types and various ages, including our recently active volcanoes and probably future active volcanoes and then some older ones. So a lot of the things we like about Oregon relate to our volcanic history and, and also our volcanic present. Of course, there's some there's a flip side of that. Um, I could equally have put a photo of Mount St. Helens in 1980 here, but I selected, I, I elected to put this dramatic photo of this uh, Chilean volcano, which is called Cabuco. Uh, it erupted in 2015. This was a pretty big eruption. I can't remember. Several cubic kilometers of magma were thrown into the air, um, which, is, which is pretty big in the scale of things. Could, could certainly be a lot larger, but it's pretty big. Um, the interesting thing about this eruption, it happened almost without notice. There are, normally you have seismometers and things like that on volcanoes that tell you when, when things are starting to change, when, when whatever it is underground is starting to do something different. This one, uh, almost none. So it's sort of a rare eruption and sort of a bit of a worry because uh, occasionally very dramatic things can happen without much warning. That's probably the exception rather than the rule. So Oregon does have a lot of volcanoes. This is a, is a, is a sort of a semi-geological map. It doesn't show the units, but and maybe you can't see it too well from there. It's, it's the section that goes from uh, north of Mount Jefferson, Mount Hood, down to south, almost to Crater Lake. All these black dots here are small volcanoes. And then, of course, we have the larger volcanoes like Cappy Mountain, may, may, may not have heard of. Then there's Broken Top and the Three Sisters, Mount Jefferson, Mount Hood. So, so we have literally thousands of volcanoes in Oregon. There are the big ones that people know about, the Mount Hoods and the Three Sisters. But then uh, in between those, there, there are thousands of smaller volcanoes each of which has erupted in the past and is, is if not exact, that, that location, but certainly this area is capable of future eruptions. So part of understanding Oregon and, and its geology is understanding um, how volcanoes work and how, how that influences the state's geology. Just a uh, sort of a, a primer on why that's the case. We have uh, an oceanic plate offshore. It's been created along the Juan de Fuca Ridge and other spreading centers. It's subducting beneath Oregon. That, that oceanic plate is pushed down, it heats up, it gives off water, and, and some, with the, it contains some other stuff, but it's a fluid mainly dominated by water. That moves into this region of the Earth's mantle above that plate. This is the plate going down here in this sort of 3D cartoon, and it lowers the melting temperature. So it makes that mantle melt, uh, and then that, that melt is buoyant, it moves upwards, and eventually it gets to the surface, and, and ultimately that's what gives us our volcanism. And of course, that means, of course, we're all very lucky because we live on the plate tectonic boundary, which is the greatest place of all to live. Um, you can take it from me because I grew up in a place a long way away from the plate tectonic boundary. We didn't have active volcanoes and things like that. So as a geologist, it's, this is a very exciting thing as well. Of course, you do get volcanoes and earthquakes. So um, there's that. OK, so this talk is just my personal, uh, I'll, I'll say, educated speculation on what we might expect from, from the next volcanic eruption in Oregon. It's sort of based on a number of things, which gives you an insight into the, the tools that geologists use to, to answer a question like this. First of all, it's based on what we know about our existing volcanoes. Uh, volcanoes are nice in that they tend to provide nice records of their past activity because they leave rocks behind. So we can go look at the rocks. We can look at them in detail. We look at how, look at how they're distributed around the landscape can, and, and look at all sorts of features of them and determine something about what we're actually what was the nature of that eruption that led to these rocks. So, so we can determine a lot from, from what has happened in the past. We're also lucky that, that for our volcanoes, we can also go and look at analogs that exist in other parts of the world that have erupted more recently. 
And in fact, a lot of this talk, the, the ultimate motiv motivation for this talk was driven by the fact I realized there was all this great video out there on YouTube and places like that, that, that we can use to give us an idea of what future eruptions of Oregon volcanoes look like. So the use of analogs is very important. And then, of course, there's my own sort of bias and preference here. And, and I've been lucky enough in my career to look at volcanoes on, on multiple continents in many different places. So this is, let me see, this is uh, at 16,000 feet in Chile a few summers ago. This is New Zealand and this is New Zealand as well. So um, uh, I, I have uh, some, some experience to fall back on in this. And the wind is an underline or a cross out? What's that? Last oh, yes. Yeah, so, no, thanks for pointing that. Um, <laughs> what, what I'm not going to talk about necessarily is the wind. Because that, that's, you know, in, in the analogy to earthquakes, it's very difficult and it's impossible actually to say, well, this volcano, Mount Hood, will erupt on such and such a date in the future. I can provide you with a probability, for instance, the prob probability of Mount Hood erupting in the next 30 to 50 years is a few percent. So it's a probabilistic forecast. I can't tell you what date that will be on. That's not, it's not possible at, at the moment. So I'm not going to talk about when. I could, guess I could speculate on that, but um, it, would be, it would be pretty rampant speculation, even compared to some of the other speculation I'm going to make. So of course, in geology, we have a mantra, which is the past is the key to the present and the future. And that means by looking at what's happened in the past, um, we can get a reasonable idea of what's happening in the future. If a volcano, for instance, has erupted in a certain fashion again and again and again in the past, all the best estimates, kind of like saying to someone, the best predictor of your future behavior is your past behavior, exactly the same applies to a volcano. And so, and part of that is just getting out on the ground and mapping. So this is a geologic map. It's being held up by two US geologists that I've worked with, uh, Cynthia Gardner and Willie Scott, who've done the, the hazard mapping for Mount Hood. And this is the geologic map of Mount Hood. They're holding up now. Cynthia, unfortunately, is hidden behind it. Um, and so, so uh, we, we know a lot. We know a lot about volcanoes, and we can use that to kind of uh, peer into the future, if you like, by looking at their past. And then, of course, as I said, there's analogs. And we have many good recent analogs that we can use to understand what a volcanic eruption of, of a given volcano might look like. And that's important because different eruption types have very different hazards. This is a, a USGS cartoon. It just shows the sort of generic range of hazards that yeah, can be associated with volcanic activity. Volcanic, volcanic eruptions are one of sort of the, the nature's most dramatic phenomena, and, and, and they often represent sort of regimes of temperature and physics, uh, temperature and pressure and other variables like that that we're really not used to in, in regular life or in everyday life. And there are a lot of the hazards that are associated. So there are things like lava flows, where lava just flows gradually down the volcano under the influence of gravity. Um, there can be more dramatic things uh, like uh, Ash, uh, pyroclastic flows, where you get a very hot ash cloud that flows down the side of a volcano. We'll see some nice examples of these, kind of like an avalanche, but several hundred degrees uh, Celsius. There are hazards that are more important when you get near to a volcano, such as these things called bombs, uh, which, which are basically large rocks which are thrown out by explosions on ballistic trajectories. Uh, and then there are ash, ash that can float in the air and then travel for quite some distance, sometimes all around the world, several times before it... Uh, deposits on the ground or turns into things like acid rain. It can even have a, a, a climatic effect because of the sulfate in that. So then, and actually one other hazard I'll point out, we can also particularly, this is relevant to Northwest volcanoes, when you get a hot magma that comes out of a volcano and interacts with snow and ice, and nearly all our volcanoes have significant snow and ice on them, uh, that can melt and you get a lot of water until you get these lahars, which are basically a mud flow or, or a debris type flow that, that flows down rivers. And I have a nice film of those. All right, so this will be in three parts. First part, I'm going to talk about my best bet for the next eruption. Uh, this is a talk I gave in Ben, so it has some local flavor, but it's actually not relevant to Newport, sorry. Uh, and then if, if there is time, there'll be a bonus stop. And actually, after that, there will be an extra bonus stop, which I put in exactly for this audience. OK, so this is my first place I'm going to go to. It's a hint. In November 2005, these two gentlemen were uh, canoeing down the Columbia River, uh, and they came across the mouth of what is now the Sandy River, and uh, William Clark recorded the following. I arrived at the entrance of a river which appeared to scatter over a sandbar. I attempted to wade this, oh, I turned away from the text. Uh, I attempted to wade this stream, and to my astonishment, found the bottom of quicksand and impassable. So the Sandy River, which is in Troutdale, uh, empties into the Columbia River in Troutdale, um, is named the Sandy River because of this. 
It was initially called the Quicksand River, but, but that has been contracted to the Sandy River. Um, and they are describing the, the sedimentary effects of, of Oregon's most recent volcanic eruption, which occurred at Mount Hood. They didn't see the eruption itself. Th that eruption started in the early 1780s and probably continued for a decade, maybe a decade and a half. Um, but what they, but because you're, you know, basically when you do that, you're producing a lot of rock in a very high area, sedimentation processes act to erode that and move all that material down the river. So they saw the sedimentological response of that eruption, which was still continuing several decades, after, at least a decade after the, the eruption ended. What they also describe is something that doesn't really match the Sandy River now. So, so if you go to the Sandy River now, there is a, this is the mouth of the Sandy River, there is a considerable delta here. And most of this material is related to the, that 1780s eruption of Mount Hood. So, so the sediments are still flushing down the river. Um, however, there's no quicksand there anymore. So, so they, what they describe as sort of a transient feature that is no longer present, which is how we know it's probably related to that eruption. And I'll, I'll return to the Sandy River here a little bit further upstream um, to Oxbow State Park at the end of this. So my best bet then for the next eruption, uh, Oregon's volcanic eruption is, is Mount Hood. That should perhaps be obvious by now. Uh, that's also something of a private bet because it's a probably the volcano I've worked on most in Oregon. So I have tremendous potential professional kudos to gain if it would suddenly erupt before my career ends. <laughs> I would, I would get a lot of citations and, and money would rain from the, the, the money tree. I was, I was actually at NSF headquarters a few years ago, uh, a few weeks ago, and we decided it's not really a money tree, it's like a money shrub. Or, or, <laughs> so, so only little bits of money can rain. Anyway, this is Mount Hood. One of the nice things about Mount Hood is you can see its recent volcanic history written in its shape. So, so this is a view from the south side, and you'll see it's dominated by this smooth surface here. This is called the Timberline Surface because Timberline Lodge is somewhere here at Timberline. This is the Palmer Snowfield. That's uh, one of the few year-round uh, ski areas in Oregon, although this fall I'm pretty sure it didn't operate year-round because it almost disappeared. Um, anyway, if you, if, you to, if you look at, say, this, the, the, the east side of Mount Hood, and it, well, I don't have a photo from the back, but you would notice it remarkable, it's, it's quite different topographically. So it's, it's basically um, dominated by deep canyons driven by glaciation, which is the normal state of being for a Pacific Northwest volcano. Basically, a Pacific Northwest volcano, if it's not growing, it's coming apart because, because uh, erosion is very active because of our high precipitation rates and prevalence of glaciers. So, so volcanoes get torn apart pretty quickly here. So to see a smooth surface like this, you know this is something that is relatively recent and it's not to do with erosion. So this is, a, this is basically a volcanic feature. This, this surface was produced 1500 years ago in a thing called the Timberline eruption phase when we had a lava dome eruption. So that is lava started piling out at the top of the volcano. It destabilized this whole third, like a sector of the volcano, and that collapsed and fell off in a massive landslide. And, and we know what that looks like because that's sort of what happened at Mount St. Helens in 1980. These, these sector collapses, um, before that, people didn't really know, although the Russians had documented them um, from after an eruption in the 1950s when, when a similar thing happened. In the West at that time, we didn't really understand, but now we know that what happened, this surface represents a massive failure of this volcanic ed edifice. You can still see the scars of this. So these are the scars. These would represent the original surface of the volcano. This is half the original crater at the top but the rest has fallen off. And it produced, that, that landslide produced this nice flat surface. So that was the second most recent eruption of Mount Hood. The most recent also occurred up here where lava formed the new lava dome in pretty much the same location. And then that material collapsed and went down over the White River, which is the, the canyon on the right-hand side of the surface or, or the zigzag canyon, which is on the left. You can get a little bit better feel for this. This is just an aerial photo from the USGS. So this is our lava dome at the surface. This is our nice, uh, smooth, relatively smooth surface. Now it's not perfectly smooth. If you get out there and walk around on it, it's got some topography for sure, but it's very different from the type of topography you get uh, elsewhere on the volcano. And then this is the White River is one of the places where the, the eruption 200 years ago channeled down. So I, I want to show you this video, which is actually from Mount St. Helens. And let's, this one I did test and it worked, so we'll try that. This is uh, from 2004. It's a time-lapse photo of what a growing lava dome looks like. Basically, a lava dome is a phenomenon you get when you get magma that is so viscous. So viscous is sort of the reverse of runny. Think cold peanut butter. 
this magma is so viscous, but it's relatively gas poor. So when it's squeezed up out of the ground, it can't run and flow anywhere. It's not, it's not runny enough to do that. Its rheology doesn't let it do that. It just sort of piles up in the surface. So you can see what happened at Mount St. Helens is you've got a series of these sort of, kind of like squeezing toothpaste, you know, from the tube. You squeeze these out, they form these nice things called whalebacks, relatively smooth surface. Um, this was extremely viscous magma. This is sort of almost as viscous as they come. So here comes another whaleback coming. But then importantly, you'll see eventually the weight of that becomes too much for its strength and it collapses and falls apart. That's really characteristic of lava domes. They sort of grow in these pulses. At some point, it, it comes out of the ground. You get this nice dome forming. Sometimes you can form spires that are several hundred meters high. But eventually, the, the mass of that gets too much for the strength of the rock and it falls apart. Now, when you're in, in here, this is in the crater of Mount St. Helens. This, this material here is the, uh, a series of lava domes from the 1980s. They sort of act as a buttress for this. Um, and prevent, you know, so when those collapse happens, it, it prevents um, that, that lava going anywhere. It just sort of collapses and forms a big, what looks like a pile of rubble. However, if you go to a volcano, you can imagine this is Mount Unzen in Japan. Uh, it, it's actually very similar to Mount Hood in many ways. Um, but the, the, and, and one difference is that this, the, the lava dome here that is forming is not captured by a crater and, and sort of buttressed by other, la other lava domes. It's sort of on the edge. So if this thing collapses, there's nothing to hold it. And I want to show you this video, which is, is a pretty famous collapse event of this lava dome at Mount Unzen. It's famous, unfortunately, because this particular event killed uh, 30, 40 people. I can't remember the exact number, including uh, three pretty famous volcanologists and then a bunch of reporters who were actually in a location where they felt like they were safe, but th this was a much bigger event than had happened previously. But basically what happened at Unzen is this lava dome would grow on the side of the volcano. It would exceed its own strength, it would collapse, and that would that just repeated again and again and again. And this is something that, that happened at Mount Hood 200 years ago, and it would, will probably happen again, the next eruption there too. Um, so, so these predictable eruptions are great, but they were relatively small until there was a bigger one happened, and that had suckered people into being in a place that was unsafe. What happens is this, you'll see the rock collapse. Actually, I'll talk a little bit before it runs. Uh, and I'm going to make sure the sound's off because it's a very loud soundtrack. Um, here we go. Uh, uh, what, th this rock is very hot. So it's probably, it, it's not molten. It may have little bits of molten uh, molten liquid inside it, but it, it's, it's, it's pretty hot. It's probably something like six or 700 degrees. As it fractures, it entrains a lot of air with it. And it superheats that air, so the whole mixture starts to expand, and, and basically it, it forms a very friction, frictionless cloud that then of rocks and ash and hot gas that can then flow under gravity down the volcano. And this is a type of pyroclastic flow, which is a pretty common phenomenon with some volcanoes. And these things, because it's kind of like an avalanche, except it's a, a snow avalanche, the same sort of thing. Air gets entrained in the snow and, and re reduces friction, so avalanches can, tra can, can travel very fast under the influence of gravity. Um, this is the same, except you have the addition of all that heat as well. So whenever air gets in train, it expands as well. So it makes these things even more mobile. Oh yeah, it's going to work. So here you can see that this is the, the lava dome collapsing. There's no scale here, but this was a pretty big chunk of rock. And then you'll start to see, instead of that stuff just coming to a rest, it formed this very mobile cloud. It's sweeping down a river valley, so it's sort of topographically confined, except these are well known for, they get so much energy that they reach a point where often uh, if the river bends or something like that, if the valley bends, they just, they stop worrying about what, what topography looks like and they just go straight ahead. So he survived, he's fine. They survived, so we can not worry about that. But you can see the destructive power of this. What, what you're looking at here mainly is the finer dust and ash that's generated because there's tons of collisions happening between rocks within this glowing cloud. Um, and actually, that's not that's a dangerous part of it, but that's not really the dangerous part. The really dangerous part is inside here where we can't see uh, uh, hundreds to thousands of millions of rocks ranging from hand size, baseball size, to car size, which are traveling downhill sometimes up to several hundred miles per hour, and they're all at about six or 700 degrees Celsius. So, so um, extremely destructive. And, and for instance, this is the same sort of phenomena that took out Pompeii in AD, whenever that was, uh, and it happened at Mount Pinatubo in the 1990s. And exactly the same sort of phenomena um, happened at Mount Hood. And I can show you what the rock that produced looks like. This is from a place at Mount Hood uh, on the White River. It's just upstream, uh, up, upstream, up from the White, up the White River from the White River Snow Park, which is a place you can go. You can walk to this location. 
this is Mount Hood here. It's about the summit's about eight kilometers away. So, so the unit we have here traveled at least eight kilometers. It probably traveled significantly further than that. We're about four or five thousand feet below the summit. So you can imagine the the potential energy there is quite significant. So, so uh, if you if you like had say an air hockey table that was you know eight kilometers long and it was a four thousand kilometer drop and you had your puck on the air hockey table essentially frictionless and you let it fall, you could imagine it would be traveling quite rapidly when it when it reached uh, your location. These are a bunch of students. I, I take students here, but this is actually what the deposit looks like. It doesn't actually look like that much, kind of like a pile of rocks. And, and um, volcanoes like Mount Hood have lots of piles of rocks. Um, so it takes a little bit of working out to, to work actually what's going on. But there's a number of, of clues that give away this origin. One is if you go and look at the magnetic orientation of all these blocks, and I haven't done this, the USGS has, they all have exactly the same orientation. If this was just a pile of rocks that collapsed from somewhere up high and, and, and fell down the mountain like a debris flow, you'd expect the rocks would have preserved Earth's magnetic field where they were, but by the time by the time they come to rest, all the magnetic directions would be different. So what this tells you is that the rocks came to rest at a temperature higher than, than you can preserve a magnetic field, which is about 550 degrees. Also, if you look at them, um, you often see lots of rocks that look like this. And this is a dead giveaway for a geologist. Um, uh, this rock here, um, you can see it's, it's characterized by all these fractures. These are sort of analogous to the fractures you find on the surface of a mud puddle as it cools and contracts. So these are contraction fractures. They tell you the rock was hot and then cooled very rapidly. On, but, but you can, and that's good, so you know that it was hot, so you know it had something to do with magma. The other thing is this rock is in place because if this rock had fallen downhill at all, it would just fall apart. So you know whatever caused these fractures um, happened in place. This is not actually from the White River. This is just above Timberline Lodge, but the same process uh, is operating. So you know that this rock was very hot. It came to rest and then it cooled very rapidly. So this is another clue you can you can sort of uh, look at. I was going to talk a little bit about some of the, the more detailed science I do, but I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip that and get to it. So we think we have a good idea of what, what the next eruption of Mount Hood would look like. It's the most recent eruption of, of Oregon's volcanoes, so it's my bet as the, the most likely future eruption, hopefully in our lifetime, but I don't really know. It would be tri-dramatic. It could last for decades, at least at least a decade or so, certainly multiple years. Uh, many other eruptions around the world, Mount Unzen I showed you. This volcano, Sufria Hills, which is in the Caribbean island of Montserrat, uh, both lasted for decades plus. So it would be a very dramatic event if something like that happened. Um, th this uh, volcano, Sufria Hills, is, is another good example. This again is at one of these lava domes. This photo is taken at night, so you can see the incandescence, and you can start to see how hot these rocks are. And you can also get an idea of the, the amount of magma multiplied by the temperature, how much energy we have captured here. And you can see when this volcano started erupting, it did have a crater. So, so the lava dome was confined for many, many years, but the volume of stuff that came out just got too much, and it started to flow over on this. Uh, this is the south side, I believe. Unfortunately, the south side down here is where the capital city, Plymouth, of this um, island was. And that's pretty much been devastated. I'll show you some photos now. Because this uh, lava dome continues to collapse. It generates these pyroclastic flows which sweep down. You know, there's nothing to stop them. There's a little bit of topography, but that's being buried. Uh, and in fact, some of these are so energetic that they can travel across the ocean. So they reach the, the sea and they keep traveling. So I didn't think of it before. That's quite relevant here. We're down by the beach. so. Uh, pyroclastic flows can even walk on water. This is um, the town of Plymouth before the eruption. I don't know exactly when it was <coughs> taken, but it was um, uh, Montserrat was a very famous location for recording artists, and so the Beatles recorded there and Dire Straits. And in fact, there is a uh, a, a small conference center or meeting place there that was built. Um, you can Google this up. There is a thing called the Concert for Montserrat, which happened in the late 90s. Um, lots of famous British artists, because this, this, this was a British island, um, or a British ex-island. Uh, and so lots of famous musicians went here, and there was a famous recording studio. The, the Beatles were there anyway. It was sort of a, a, a tourist haven. But it changed very, dramat changed very dramatically after this eruption. And, and the town of Plymouth, which was the best uh, land, the most arable land, all of that has been uh, taken away by this volcano. So the island has changed very dramatically. A couple of close-up photos. Um, this is what it looks like when these pyroclastic flows interact with buildings. So this is the second floor here. So the first floor is buried, uh, and there's clearly rocks have large rocks have traveled in. 
in this case, a very large rock um, uh, has gone through the roof of this house. What, wandering around, it's actually starting to become, the volcano has quietened down. Uh, so Plymouth is actually becoming sort of a tourist destination as a modern sort of Pompeii. There's, there's very few, there's not as many dead people there, fortunately. Um, there were unfortunately a few deaths associated with this eruption, but just a few tens of people, um, maybe more, maybe like 50 or something like that. But it, it's becoming a tourist destination, which is good, because this island doesn't have many economic exports. After all, its farmland was destroyed. Uh, ironically, one of its biggest exports is, is aggregate and rock, because they can just sort of dig it out. Um, there's another problem, though. So the photo on the left here is, is um, standing on a former jetty, and so this is a bollard. Uh, and this was a deep water port. I don't know how deep, um, so if anyone has a question like that, I can't answer it. But you can see the shoreline now, this is in 2015, so it hasn't really changed. The shoreline is significantly further out than this. And this is a photo that I saw on a wall somewhere. So this is what that originally looked like. So I'm standing about uh, somewhere here, I think. Maybe here. So the shoreline has been built out significantly by addition of many, many, many tons of rock. But of course, it's, it's removed all utility of this place as a port as well. Uh, another hazard that is pretty common, as I, as I mentioned briefly, oops, I'll touch on this briefly if this movie plays. Unfortunately, this movie takes a long while to get going, so um, I'll just have to watch it. Alahaz, these are these volcanic mud flows. This is basically what happens if you get a volcano that will melt a lot of snow and ice. That snow and ice then mixes with rocks, either the, the, the magma that's erupting itself or other rocks that are lying around which is pretty common on volcanoes. I thought I'd turn the sound off. No, I guess that doesn't turn off. Um, and so uh, it ends up, it, it, it goes down river drainages sort of as like a, a rock-filled cement type mixture. So it has a tremendous amount of energy again, can go a tremendous amount of distances, and basically will destroy anything in its path. So you can see that the, the size of rocks that are being pushed along by the stuff, for instance, if this comes in contact with a bridge, it will often remove the bridge at Mount St. Helens in 1980. There were a number of bridges that were destroyed by this. Um, so this, this is another uh, hazard. And these things are actually quite hazardous because they can occur without an eruption. If you just get a major rainfall event like at Mount Hood, occasionally these have happened due, due to um, pineapple expresses, uh, atmospheric river events. And to close the loop with uh, Lewis and Clark on this, you can sort of see the effects of, of those lahars that happened 200 and something years ago. If you go to this place, Oxbow State Park, which is getting down towards the, the mouth of the Sandy River, what you're looking at here is a bank, and this is about, I think, 50 or 60 meters high. These are 200 and something year old trees, which were buried by volcanic mud flows and are now being re-eroded out by the action of the, the modern day Sandy River. So all this is debris from that 1780s, 1790s um, uh, eruption, which has been moving progressively down the river, and it killed these trees, but now they're being re-eroded. So, so that river graded by something like 50 to 100 meters. So, so if that happened today, that would obviously have a big effect on, on Troutdale, uh, areas like that, um, lots of flooding, all sorts of things. All right, so that's the first part. That's my best bet for a future eruption of, of Oregon is an eruption of Mount Hood, and I think that's the most probable, probably what it will look like, the most probable idea of what it will look like. Now, for contrast, I want to do something slightly different and go to another place. And this is Newbury Volcano in central Oregon. It's a very different type of volcano than Mount Hood. It has much shallower sides. Mount Hood has relatively steep sides. And, and they sort of, th these are two examples of a pretty well-known distinction between types of volcanoes, which are the stratovolcanoes. This is your Mount Hood. They tend to have more viscous, uh, uh, magmas, that, and they tend to erupt more, more fragmental type deposits, and that gives them steep sides. Shear volcanoes uh, erupt basalt, which is a much less viscous magma, so it tends to flow much more easily. And as a result, it tends to build these more shallower sides, shield volcanoes, and that's just named because it looks like a, a shield in profile. So Newbury Volcano is an excellent example of, of what a shield volcano looks like. This is the LIDAR uh, Maybe a little too close to see the shape of Newbury Volcano, but this is um, this is the the caldera. It's an unusual volcano in that it has a big caldera at the summit, which is basically a big region produced by uh, removal of lava during a big eruption in the past. That magma, sorry, magma underground can no longer support the crust and it collapses. So, so these are basically these lakes, East Lake and uh, East Lake and Lake Paulina, are filled in holes produced by evacuation of magma during a big eruption in the past. Um, 
th these are the things that people often focus on with Newbury, but it's also surrounded by just a tremendous number of basaltic lava flow, basalt lava flows, and it's been created just by lava flow upon lava flow upon lava flow. All these little craters mark the place where lots of lava flows start, and we'll, we'll see a good example of this from further north at Lava Butte that I want to talk about a little bit more. But so here we are out in the flanks. The, the lava flows from Newbury Volcano have traveled a long way. So uh, they have traveled as far north as Redmond in the past, which is something like 70 kilometers. So you could imagine today the effect on local real estate. If, if a, a major lava flow started somewhere like here and flowed through Bend into Redmond, um, that, would, that would be quite, quite devastating. Fortunately, the most recent eruption of that type was 70,000 years ago or something like that. So it's not. Um, the most recent eruptions at, at Newbury, well, there's Big Obsidian Flow, which is uh, just a, a bit over a thousand years old. Um, and then out here on what's called the Northwest, Northwest Rift Zone, there are a bunch of eruptions that are about 7,000 years ago. And we'll be returning to this place, which is the Lava Lands Visitor Center and Lava Butte in, in just a little bit. But before we have to do that, we go somewhere else um, to provide an insight, another analog that lets us provide some, it gives us some insight into what a future eruption of Newbury Volcano would look like, which is what I'm building towards. And this is our hint, so a drink with an umbrella. And of course, that is Hawaii. So even though in terms of plate tectonics, we're going to go to a very different area. We're going to go to the middle of a plate where, where, where the, these volcanoes are the product of these mantle plumes, enormously hot regions of mantle that move upwards and punch through the overlying plate. It's very different to what drives our volcanoes in Oregon. But physics being physics and, and chemistry being chemistry, it doesn't change from place to place on the Earth. So if you have the same set of circumstances, you can get exactly the same result. So Kilauea volcano, for instance, is, a, is, is in some sense a very nice analog for, for Newbury volcano. And particularly, the most, I'm moving towards the most recent eruption, which you might remember in April, started in April 2018 and continued for several months. It was on newspapers a lot, lots of spectacular footage. And we can use some of that to understand what a future eruption of Newbury volcano might look like. The island of Hawaii itself, the big island, is just a coalesced mass of numerous volcanoes. Three of them have had um, recent activity, by, by I mean historical, European historical activity. Uh, Hawaii, Mauna Loa, and then Kilauea. And there's, of course, another one uh, off the, the a submarine Luihi volcano, which is active too. And there are Mauna Kea and Kohala, which are older. I'm going to talk about Kilauea. So in, in very late April uh, 2018, Kilauea, it, it's, actually, I'll go back. Um, Kilauea is an interesting volcano. So it has eruptions that occur both at its summit region, and you might have been there to Hale Mau Mau um, Caldera, uh, and then it also have like actually like lots of shield volcanoes can have eruptions at the summit, but then also on these elongate zones that spread out in typically at 180 to 180 degrees from each other. So there's the northwest <coughs> rift zone of Kilauea, and then another rift zone. You can see Mauna Loa is sort of the same. This is the summit region, but then there are these elongate rift zones, and and. Typically, the, the lavas erupt along here, and then they flow under gravity sort of off in some direction from, 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 uh, from where they erupt. Because lavas are liquid, they flow under gravity. Not exactly the same as water for, for a number of reasons. The physics is different, but they do flow under gravity. So in early April 2018, um, the, the Hale Mau Mau, uh, the crater at, at Kilauea Summit was actually really full of magma. In fact, it was so full it started to spill out. So, so magma levels had got high enough to spill out. They changed very dramatically over the course of just a few days. Um, uh, there was a lot of earthquakes that started occurring progressively further and further out in this rift zone, and, la and lake levels, lava lake levels, started to drop both at um, Hale Mau Mau and then further down at this other place called Pupu O'o, which is another very long-lived place that often, if you've been to Kilauea, you might remember. Um, so, and earthquakes moved progressively down the rift, unfortunately towards more populated regions, because these are regions that hadn't seen lava flows. Uh, some had seen lava flows in the 1950s, but some not, not nearly as recently as that. Um, and it signaled a major change in activity of this volcano from lots of stuff happening in the summit. And in fact, now there is no magma at the summit. Occasionally you might see pictures that the summit area is completely different. It's like a big hole, it even has a lake at the bottom. Um, and, and so basically what happens is sort of, I mean, this is a coarse example. It's a bit like a toilet bowl. You have a, a hydraulic head here of a lot of magma. It's present. It's at the summit. It's high. So it's several thousand feet below here. Uh, with a toilet, you know, you have a valve to stop that water draining away. You, you open that valve, the water drains away. So somehow the plumbing system changed here uh, and, and started to let vol uh, lava move down the rift zones along a series of subterranean fractures. 
and, and basically it was all driven by that hydro hydraulic head gradient. Perhaps not all driven, but largely driven by that hydraulic head gradient. So a lot of lava sort of drained down and then eventually erupted further out in the rift zone. So this is just a map of, this is the, the far out in that rift zone. This is, is showing us um, the first stage of that eruption was, was a series of or a, a relatively large number of isolated fractures, all oriented in this northwest direction, the same as, um, sorry, northeast, uh, uh, the, the same as the, this general shape of this rift zone. Um, and a whole lot of them started appearing. And then, then eventually longer lava flows. I might return to that map. I want to show you what, this is kind of what the fissures look like. So initially, a fissure might look like this, truly just a fissure. This is just a, a place where, where a fracture has propagated to the surface. Eventually, you might find hot gases coming out of this, or it would be at least anomalously hot. Uh, but and eventually, some of these um, magma started showing up at the surface, and so form of these, these hot fissures. This is really characteristic of this type of eruption, erup, volcanic eruption. In fact, it's called a Hawaiian eruption because they start with these series of fissures. So long features and magma is sort of rising as a curtain at this point. I think I have some videos, so if the video works, I can show you what that looks like. So there's a, there's a couple of interesting things to note here. So, so magma is coming out of these fissures. But it's not really actually, it looks spectacular. It's not coming out really that rapidly. And, and I just ask you to remember that because I'll show you some stuff before. In fact, you can see the fissure here and, and you can get close enough to take a photo. So there are some lava flows happening, but they're relatively small here. Not, not that they're undramatic. And because these fissures were coming up in, an, in someone's neighborhood, that there, was, there was already quite a, a deal of destruction to property related to this phase. This is sort of, um, what I'm talking about. Okay, so you have this long curtain, and then you have these small mounds. This is where the stuff that is coming out of this, this fissure, the magma, it's just thrown up in the air, and it sort of plops down. It, there's not that much of it, so there's not. it tends to cool before it can flow very far. You get these little sort of dome-like lava <coughs> flows, but really not too much. <laughs> this is very characteristic for an early phase of one of these Hawaiian lava flows. So you get, a, remember, you get a fissure, relatively small lava flows. Eventually what happens, it's sort of like the Hunger Games, um, some point or one of these fissures, if there are multiple fissures, and even one point along a single fissure, wins the battle to be the major conduit. At the same time, the amount of magma that's coming out of the ground increases dramatically. So the fissure that won in this case was this thing called Fissure 8. So this is Fissure 8 right here. So the number, you can't see the number of the fissures, but they're up to sort of 22 individual fissures were, were identified. But eventually it all came down to Fisher 8 being the one that won in, in sort of the competition to be the place where, where almost all the lava comes out of the surface. And then sometime in May, we had a dramatic change from that um, Fisher type eruption to, to everything being dominated by, by Fisher 8 and a very much larger flux of magma coming out. So this is what Fisher 8 started to look like. A big river of magma coming out, feeding a big lava flow. And then stuff is being thrown on the ground and forming a crater where that's coming out. I'm pointing out all these features. I'm going to show you exactly the same features related to the most recent eruption of Newbury Volcano 7,000 years ago. And of course, what, what, what this represents, that early phase was probably magma that was already existing in that rift zone that was sort of being pushed by a, by a hydraulic head gradient of, of a big amount of magma coming down. It was sort of being reactivated. It formed those fissures all over the place. Um, but then eventually that big whole mass of, of magma coming from the summit arrived and, and things changed very dramatically. So this is some aerial footage of that phase. So you can see stuff really coming out of this volcano very quickly. And, and again, it's building, stuff is being thrown up in the air. Uh, some of it keeps going down here, but then fall, things fall on the side here and so it builds its own cone as well. So eventually that keeps going for, for that, that was the major phase of the eruption, particularly if we consider the volume of stuff erupted, that really was the major phase of the eruption. Nothing else really counts. We were lucky, one of my ex-PhD students um, was a, is a geologist at the Alaska Volcano Observatory, the USGS, but they were so short-handed that um, he, he got to go and fly around with some volcanoes. I wasn't jealous. I was jealous. Um, and then, so, so and, and then eventually what happens, lava moves downhill. As I said, it, it flows downhill. It's not exactly like water because unlike water, um, the viscosity of, of magma is a big function of temperature. 
and and so the and and magma is going to cool if you put magma onto the surface earth it's going to cool so collectively that means it's, it flows a little differently in the water and a little more harder to predict but basically the flow path from fissure eight took it down on the other side uh, on the inland side of the the ridge formed by the rift zone but eventually it turned the corner and came through and then and flowed out to sea this is a sort of a, a thermal image so the bright here is the active lava flows and again, this is another very common thing with, with lava flows once they start happening. They move downhill. If you go downhill, eventually you hit water in nearly every part of the world I can think of. So, so nearly always part of one of these types of eruptions ends up with magma um, uh, interacting with water. In Hawaii, it's pretty, it's pretty spectacular when it reaches the sea. You don't want to be there because the vapor here is a mixture of fine glass and hydrochloric acid. So it's not something you want to breathe. But it's good to look at from, from afar. Um, so we can sort now what I want to do is look at la la the lava butte eruption which happened uh, a little over 7,000 years ago on the on the northwest river zone of Newbury sorry I didn't show a map uh, I don't have a map on this part but I, I'll just I think I can show you where it is before many of you may have been to lava butte you used to be able to drive to the top there's a visitor center on top uh, there is a nice visitor center at the bottom you can take this great um, guided walk in fact that might even be the trail there onto the surface of his lava flow which is great because if you ever tried to walk on one of these this is an art uh -uh type lava flow which is a blocky lava flow they're very nasty to walk on without a trail so this is the one of the best places in the world i know to walk on them because otherwise you go through a pair of boots in a week or something like that walking on this stuff um we can see a couple of features we have a nice cone um it's a little different from that fissure eight cone which was open-sided but this this is formed by stuff being thrown up in the air and just collapsing back on the surface so this is sort of the surface of minimum slope minimum failure um, and then there is this fissure at the bottom here where a lava flow was issued from uh, should i maybe i'll talk about that here so so what we can see here actually is 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 Part of this transition that I was talking about, you start with a fissure eruption, and there was a part of it I didn't mention. Um, you start with a fissure eruption, then it generally contracts to a single place, and that's where you tend to get a lava flow. The early parts of that eruption, for various reasons, are often rich in gas. So they're often really vigorous, and that's what builds things like this cone. That's where you're getting what, what are called fire fountain episodes, which is basically like holding a, a hose of lava straight up in the air, and the lava gets thrown up in the air. It falls down as smaller pieces, uh, and they form this nice cone. Eventually, you often get to magma that is has lower amounts of gas in it, and it's really gas that drives most volcanic eruptions or the expansion of gas. That stuff without gas in it is much more dense. Uh, it doesn't erupt as vigorously. So in that case, it was able to punch a hole through the base of this cone. It was actually energetically easier for the lava to go out the side of the crater than to keep going up over the top. And, and so this is, is much more voluminous. It's probably hotter, but it's got lower amounts of gas that forms the lava flow. Now, the nice thing about Oregon is that they have a very uh, user-friendly uh, and public-friendly uh, LIDAR um, uh, policy. And so if you ever want to look at places like this, if you've ever done it, there is this thing called the Dogami LIDAR viewer that you can go and, and search. And you can look at, not, not the whole state is covered by LIDAR, but a lot of the volcanically active areas are. Um, so this is that same scene with, with looking at in the LIDAR, which is just a very high-resolution topography. So this is, a vol this is our volcanic cone, this is our fracture at the surface, and then this irregular textured area is the lava flow. So you can see it's really massive. It's probably at least a cubic kilometer or something like that. This is the Deschutes River, so a major water course. And of course our lava flow interacted with our, with our, water, co with our water course, and we'll get back to talking about that in a little bit. What I want to talk about first though is we can see those same early fissure related um, parts of the lava butte eruption, just like we saw happening at Kilauea in that dramatic video. If we zoom in a little bit on the bottom of this image. So again, this is the crater. Uh, this is our fracture. This is a lava flow. But here we see these things that just look like kind of uh, pancakes, if you like. So small amounts of magma. This is our initial phase of that eruption. It occurred along a fissure with something like a, you know, a trend like that. So this would be a pre-existing structure that's controlling that. There is actually a neighboring pre-existing pre -existing structure. If any geologists are in the audience, this is a really nice fault scarp. It's an area where two blocks of the earth have faulted apart. There's about 10 meter difference in, in elevation on that. Um, so this is where that earlier, relatively gas rich, but not very voluminous phase of the eruption happened. And you can see this looks very similar to some of those images I showed from Kilauea. Eventually, oh yeah, and I can show you actually, if you go and crawl around on these, they, they have features that are very similar. This is, is Exactly what you'd expect in, a, in this sort of environment, it's a thing called a spatter rampart. It's where 
kind of globs of magma being thrown up in the air. They're falling down, and then they're sort of sticking to each other and squishing each other. So this is a wall built up of squished, flattened lava bombs that were liquid enough when they fell to sort of collapse and stick to each other and flatten each other. I actually threw in this image, and you can see this is the actual crater in the distance. This photo I'm going to show is not from uh, Lava Butte. This is actually from Saudi Arabia. You can see the, the um, structure internally of this. This is where that stuff has fallen down. It's been flattened by its own momentum as it falls, and then also by the material on top of it. Sometimes if stuff's really gushing out quickly, the stuff that falls can regather and form its own lava flow and head off down the hill. When, when the flux is not so high, um, it just sticks there, and so you end up getting these rampants. And this is the fissure in the middle that, that magma was coming, coming out of. So that's our first phase. We have our fissuring phase. We can see evidence for that. Probably says that the next eruption at Newbury will begin with some sort of magma fissuring event like that. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then we get to our lava flow phase, where, which is really the main part of the eruption where, where lava starts really booking it out of the base of this volcano and forms a pretty massive lava flow. So as I said, it traveled a long way. Uh, down here, under the influence of gravity, the great topographic gradient's not very high here if you've been down this part of the world. It's, we're, we're quite close to the, the middle of the river valley. But nevertheless, there is a gradient, so the lava flow sort of traveled down here. It, it reached the, the, the Chutes River, and this is a, is a, it would be something that would be extremely problematic if it was happening today as well, because it dammed the Deschutes River at this point and formed this thing called Lake Benham which was a, a major body of water that lasted for probably several thousands of years. It backed the Deschutes River up several tens of miles. Um, fortunately, what, what can happen often in that case is where you form a dam like that, like anywhere you form a dam, through a glacier or, or through a, a debris flow or a landslide or something like that, is you can have catastrophic failure of that. Um, that didn't happen in this case. What, what happened is the Deschutes River eventually cut itself a new canyon, and this is Benham Falls, if you've ever been there. And, and eventually found a new path down through this. So, so the lake didn't release catastrophically. It released gradually, which is probably good. Um, however, if, if that were to happen today, there's no guarantee that you wouldn't get catastrophic releases of water. And of course, Bend is downstream from that. So that's an obvious hazard to consider here. So will this be the next eruption of, of Oregon? I don't know. The most recent one happened 7,000 years ago. But the, best, the main reason I, I like to show it is because you can look at those features that happened at Kilauea in 2018. And it happened pretty much every rift eruption that, that you see at Kilauea. And we can see exactly the same features happening at Newbury. So even when we're talking about different plate tectonic environments, we can say this is probably what a flank eruption of Newbury is going to look like in the future. All right, so one very short bonus stop. I'm reaching the end of my time. This is a hint. It's not really much of a hint because it's right there. Um, <laughs> this is Crater Lake. Um, this, is, uh, this is obviously Crater Lake. So it's a caldera. It's a volcanic feature produced by a very large eruption. So the eruption of Mount Mazama, which happened also about 7,000 years ago, um, no coincidence, um, was, was about 50 cubic kilometers of lava, of, of magma. That's a big amount. In, in the scheme of things, Mount St. Helens in 1980 was about 1 cubic kilometers. Mount Pinatubo was about 10. This is about 50. Of course, if we're talking Yellowstone, we get up to several thousand, five, several hundreds to, to thousands. And the biggest eruption known maybe a little north of 5,000 cubic kilometers. So they're not as big as that. But what happens here is, it, I, I mentioned this with Newbury, you have so much magma under the ground, it erupts so rapidly that the, the ground is no longer supported by that magma and it just collapses. Of course, it rains a lot in Oregon, so or it snows a lot in the case of Prey Lake. So, so over the years, this filled with water and we end up with a nice lake, which is very blue. Um, what has subsequently happened, though, is there's been continued volcanic activity. And so Wizard Island is the best example of that. It's about 4,000 years old. It's a, it's a, a sort of a, a, a subsequent eruption. It's much, much smaller, but it's basically built itself up from the lake floor, which is, this is a deep lake. So there's actually quite, quite an amount of material. What, that, what this means, though, is if this sort of eruption were to happen in the future, it would be extremely spectacular. And the reason it would be extremely spectacular is the presence of water. Um, water expands very dramatically when you heat it. I think it's a factor of 1,500 going from water to steam, probably depending a little on the pressure. So anytime you have magma, which is at temperatures of 800, 900, 1,000 degrees Celsius, a lot, of temp a lot of heat, and you have water, you have the presence for a lot, you have the potential for a lot of energy and significant, basically, steam explosions or, or magma steam interactions and explosions that result. And you get a very characteristic type of eruption style from that. 
Uh, it's called phreatic in the case of where you just heat water up and there's, there's no magma directly involved or phreatomagmatic. Um, also, this type of eruption is sometimes called Surtsey, and, and some people in this room might remember the eruption of Surtsey in Iceland, which happened in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, I was quite small then. But um, basically, it shows some of the first, first time people had observed these features related to volcanic eruptions interacting with water. So this is a video taken from a place called Anak Krakatau. Krakatau. It's uh, the smaller volcano. It's, just, it, it's quite a bit of time before this starts getting interesting, so I'll start it. Uh, it it's, uh, you've probably heard of Krakatoa. It's a very big eruption in the 1880s. In the middle, uh, or the residue of that, a smaller volcano has taken, uh, has started. That's called Anak Krakatoa. So I think that translates as Child's Krakatoa. It's pretty active. It's one of the most active volcanoes in the world. In December 2018, there was a big event there where part of that volcano fell off. It caused actually a tsunami uh, around the Sunda Strait, which killed quite a number of people, unfortunately. <laughs> And then the volcano started erupting directly into water. So what we'll see here is a, is a classic example of that in a little bit, I hope. It comes up eventually. Um, oh, here we go. I think this, we're getting close now. When, when this movie comes up on the PC, I don't have a chance to fast forward, so I just have to talk a lot. Here we go. So these things are called, these are called rooster tails. So th this is what happened is magma is hitting um, seawater. Some of that seawater gets trapped. It builds up pressure. And then that pressure is released by an explosion when basically the pressure exceeds the yield strength of that magma or that quenched magma, and it throws material in the air. So you get these characteristic white and black uh, colors. So white is steam, and then the black is the actual um, magmatic material itself. So if, if the next volcanic eruption of Oregon is at Wizard Island, I'm sure actually FEMA won't let us, or the disaster response won't let us, but we could sit on the edge of Crater Lake and we could watch something like this happen. Um, <coughs> while, you know, sipping a martini or something, it would be, be good. So I, I think that, that the last eruption of, 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 of Crater Lake was 4,000 years ago. If something happens there, oh, there's a spectacular one. If, if something happens there, it will take a long time to get to the surface because it's got to build several thousand feet. So it probably won't be, we probably won't get to see this, but um, it sure would be spectacular if we did. And then, and that's just another movie I made in case uh, that one didn't work. And then, of course, I would be foolish to not mention um, the possibility, probably, in fact, almost certainly, the next eruption, if we're going to call this an Oregon yeah. volcano, is Axial Seamount, um, which is located offshore along the, the uh, East Pacific rise. The reason that this um, is an interesting volcano it has these very um, characteristic sets of inflation and eruption. So this is um, surface, either elevation or, or tilt. I can't remember. Maybe someone in the audience knows more about this than me. I can tell out. Anyway, as magma moves into a volcano to get ready for eruption, it tends to inflate it. And so the, surf, the top surface goes up, but the sides tilt more, so you can look at the tilt or, or the elevation change. Um, and then with each eruption, that has dropped back down. Basically, this is a pressure release, a deflation event. Both the 2011 and the 2015 eruptions happened at similar thresholds, so it's currently inflating again. It doesn't take too much to draw this to align to those thresholds and say, well, you know, hopefully in the next year or so there should be an eruption of that. So if I'm honest, and I'm clearly biased towards volcanoes that are not submarine because I don't really know much about them, um, my money is on Mount Hood, perhaps Newbury, or perhaps uh, Crater Lake, but if I'm honest, probably Axial Seamount will be the, the next. If you want to know more about volcanoes, and we do live in volcano country, so I encourage you to, um, the, the USGS has an excellent uh, volcano site mainly aimed at understanding the hazards of living with volcanoes. So I, I recommend that you go and look at that. And uh, that's the end of my talk. So thank you for your attention. Questions? Yeah, uh, would you hazard a guess if you take the whole, all, the whole Cascade chain, California all the way up to British Columbia, whether it be another volcano that it's going to be Oregon. It has to be Oregon. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'd say probably um, you would have to say Mount St. Helens just because it, it last erupted, you know, a decade or so ago. So I'd say that would probably be the best. Um, possibly Mount Lassen. That's the next most recent. Uh, which it's a pretty simple calculus I'm making. I hope just what happened, what erupted most recently. So, so in truth, we don't really know. A any of those, any of the Cascade volcanoes could be the next potential in terms of the threat. Um, the, the Cascade Volcanoes, which have the highest threat, which rolls in chance of future eruption together with what the exposure to sort of human infrastructure and population would be. We're talking about Three Sisters, Newbury, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, uh, and Mount Hood. 
are the, the highest threat assessed to volcanoes. And going back to when you were talking about Plymouth, was there another place where there was a volcano like in 95 or something like that? I, I don't remember seeing pictures of like, I don't remember it was an island, but it's pretty much the same thing. The whole thing was just covered in, and I don't know if there was any warning, I guess is what the, the question I had. Those people, did a lot of people die in those? Did they have warning in those? Or? Uh, Pinatubo, that wasn't an island, but that was a big one in 92. Um, Pinatubo actually was a remark, if, if we're talking about that, but I'm sure we are, but um, it was a remarkable success in terms of early warning. There's a, a great uh, NOVA documentary called In the Path of the Killer Volcano. You can get on YouTube. I show it to students all the time that goes through that. But it was a forecasting success, but still 300 people died. Um, in this, this volcano, Montserrat, which might be the one you're thinking of, because it, it, at the time that was an island that was devastated. It was sort of a classic tropical island, devastated narrative, uh, was picked up a lot. Um, there was one particular event. It's again one of these events that is bigger than you anticipate. And um, what happened was a pyroclastic surge. So the pyroclastic uh, flow I showed you can often have these high energy, low density portions of them that really, really don't like to obey topography. So in this case, a pyroclastic flow was coming down. A surge took off the top and went kind of over topography and, and killed, I'm thinking tens of people, 20, 30, something like that. I can't. I mean, there almost certainly were other volcanoes erupting at that time. I, I can't remember um, if there were other island volcanoes. So, certainly, the big one around that time was Montserrat, Sufre Hills. Yeah. If there is a Cascadia induction, I'm not necessarily asking the question. You know, are the volcanoes going to go off? But That's would a, there be enough eroded weak spots onto them that uh, perhaps would the earthquake that it would cause them to enough in order to start a slide? Uh, that's possible. I mean, the, the relationship between great earthquakes and volcanic eruptions is one of these things that people have debated about for a long time. And, and currently, there's, there's very little evidence that um, a big earthquake can remotely trigger an eruption. There are some examples where it's happened sort of ne nearby. So Japan, there was a, an eruption in the last few years that, that looked like it was the case, but mostly not. What you're talking about, though, is a different thing. And, and actually, maybe it's more possible. but. Um, the one volcano that people really worry about in the Cascades in this respect is Mount Rainier. So what happens with a lot of these volcanoes, they're hot, uh, there's a lot of precipitation, so you get a lot of circulation of water inside and that takes the igneous minerals, which are often strong, and turns them into clays, which are not strong. And, and Rainier is basically rotten at the heart. So periodically it just falls apart, um, un unrelated to eruption, and you get one of these very big lahar events, uh, and so people are very worried about that with Rainier. So I, I guess that is possible that if there was enough ground shaking, you could initiate um, that. I mean, sort of, sort of, kind of happened at Mount St. Helens in the 80s, where you had the, you know, you got this infamous bulge which overstayed, uh, overweighted the top of the volcano, and that gave way with an earthquake, or an earthquake triggered that giving away. It's sort of a chicken and egg thing. But there was a magnitude five earthquake nearby that that at least was co coincident with the collapse of that. Whether it triggered it or whether it was part of it, I, I, I don't know, but. So it's possible, yeah. So back in the kind of mid-70s, they thought Mount Baker was going to explode. Yeah. And then it turned out Mount St. Helens was the one that actually got yeah. active. Is that uh, an increased knowledge of, I mean, have we learned a lot from this? Oh, uh, I'd have to say we've learned a lot. The thing that happened then is, um, and, and people are becoming more and more aware of this, that volcanoes often they can show evidence of activity without actually erupting. And that's exactly, at Mount Baker, what happened is the, the crater lake got very hot, which is sort of what you'd expect, and nothing happened. So if the same thing happened today, I think you know, the response will be more or less identical. There might be some fine tuning about understanding a little bit more, but certainly people would be super worried if, Mount, if the crater lake at Mount Baker heats up. The reason they're worried is because there's a huge amount of glaciers on that volcano, so if you start melting those, it'd be quite serious. But the same thing happened with South Sister um, starting in the late 90s with this bulge. You might have heard there was a bulge on South Sister. So that was recognized with a new technology at the time, uh, INSAR, so basically taking uh, interferometric radar images. And you lay them over and you can see you know, small earth movements. It turned out there was this bulge on the side of, Mount, uh, of, of South Sister, sort of a, a classic bullseye shape. People are like, whoa, it's bulging. Um, is it going to erupt? Turns out in the, you know, that was quite early in that technology. Turns out now, Volcanoes do that sort of stuff without erupting relatively frequently. So, so they, they are, there are events happening. Sometimes it's just in the hydrothermal system. It's not even in the, um, in, to do with magma at all. But they're, they're sort of 
they're not living, but they're active. They're doing things, and so um, certainly you can get lots of these false events, and, and yeah, it's sort of part of life. It's it's tricky because you know it makes the communication part of it very difficult. Jessica. I don't think so. I mean, I don't think the fishes themselves know when, when it happens. It's like people say, you know, when an earthquake starts, the earthquake doesn't know how big it's going to be. Um, so, I, you know, because it, it's sort of like a, a winnowing process. You know, they're all active, and then you might get sort of a very small change. That means one conjure will get slightly preferred. The others start to cool down, so they close up. This one gets bigger. So I, I don't think you could predict that. Maybe you could if you took lots of very careful measurements at the time. But I think, you know, I don't think you can even hindcast and say, would, would, what's the odds of that <coughs> fracturing the one? Yeah. So since we're in a marine station and you can see the water out front and it goes up and down with the tide, is there any evidence that it's extreme tides? There have been suggestions. There have certainly have been suggestions. Um, uh, I, might, I might be selling that aspect of the science short. I, I feel like people have argued it, but don't. I don't think it's it's there's a consensus on it, except on Io. You know, people talk about Io, the, the moon of Saturn, yeah. Jupiter. You know, the internally heating by tiding is causing sulfur, sulfur volcanism there. Um, but I don't know. Another thing people speculate is um, sort of larger Earth movements related to ice volume changes. And in fact, at Iceland, you can see that there are definitely um, everyone agrees there are changes in the amount of volcanism as you weight and unweight that island by adding ice. But that's a lot more water than the tides. Yeah. <coughs> Hydrothermal systems seem to respond to tides more. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just saying, I mean, it's, you're, you're kind of misshaping the earth. Yeah. Tide. Yeah. You're doing that, and you're, and you're loading, you know, yeah. loading it more. <coughs> yeah. The water's pretty heavy. Yeah. Are there any active volcanoes in, in Greenland? Because no. Is... Yeah, they're, they're not, fortunately. Yeah. The, the most recent. Uh, uh, Volcanoes in, in Greenland are sort of, there's some more recent, but there was a big pulse of volcanism there 55 million years ago, but that was a long time ago. That was the opening of the North Atlantic, so we're, yeah. Antarctic there are. There are some big volcanoes in Antarctica, like Erebus and uh, Mount Terror. So actually some of the most active, Erebus is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. Yeah, are there any volcanoes in Oregon that are historically connected to the Yellowstone hotspot? Uh, well, you know, sort of yes and no. So the Yellowstone hotspot, a lot of people argue, uh, and I think many of you might know Bob Duncan, for instance, at, at OSU, he's argued that the, the Solette's terrain, which is the rock that we are ultimately standing on, um, like Mary's Peak, if you've been to Mary's Peak, uh, that started as an early phase of the Yellowstone hotspot, admittedly 50 something thousand, 50 million years ago. Um, so, and then that hotspot's generally moved there, but inland since then. There, there are no currently active volcanoes in Oregon that are linked to that. Was, was there one? Um, um, if you were going to talk to the money shrub, um, <laughs> <laughs> what do you think is the most useful monitoring system that we should protect in terms of monitoring volcanic eruptions or uh, changes? Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, the, the best. Um, the best approach is a multi-parameter approach, but failing that um, is is uh, earthquakes. Seismicity is is probably the most useful, and I'm sure there might be some GPS deformation people who fight me on that. And I'm not an expert, but um, a, a very high uh, priority. And in fact, Congress has recently, um, uh, and the president even signed the bill for this thing called Enviews, which is the National Volcano Early, Early Warning System, hasn't been appropriated yet. So so. But the USGS will significantly ramp up monitoring of volcanoes, and a lot of that are, are looking at earthquakes. Because, you know, basically what a volcano is doing before it's erupting is releasing energy underground, either by breaking rocks for magma to get up, or sometimes um, magma sing, like you get pipes, you know, you get a vibration in the pipes. Um, all of that can be detected, and if you have a good enough seismic network, you can detect the location and the depth of those, and that's very useful information. Having said that, I think. It, if in terms of a modern sense of seismic monitoring, you want um, uh, both, you want to know earthquakes, you want to know deformation with GPS, you can do that very well. You want to know gas release, which is very important. 
And then you also want to do the hard work, which is crawling around the volcano and understanding its history and, and looking at the rocks to tell you what's happened deep. So they're, they're sort of four planks of a modern volcano monitoring system. So there's one other type of volcano in Oregon, like way out in eastern Oregon, like Jordan Craters, which is yeah. a very recent lava flow. So I don't I forget where it was, how was a few thousand? Yeah, the, the, so the, there is this weird, and it sort of goes to your question actually, there's this weird, you know, the Yellowstone, Yellowstone hotspot trend is going um, further inland all the time, right. and, and more, more or less the direct opposite to the North American plate. But then there is this small, odd sort of trend of volcanism that's coming back the other way, sort of reverse to plate tectonic theory. Oh. It's called the High Lava Plain, so if you know, if those of you who know Anita Grunder um, has worked a lot on that. That's under debate. That could actually relate to the, and some people think Newbury Volcano is the most, is the current location of that. It looks like a heat source that's tracking back towards the coast. It's, it's going in the opposite direction to predict from plate tectonics. People argue about it, but it might be to do with our, our subducting plate is steepening and that's sort of drawing in hot material, but that, that's under debate, yeah. Mm. yeah you, used, you used the word debate a number of times. I'm wondering what's the most controversial Controversial topic in the field. There's a lot of them. Um, <laughs> I mean, this, this uh, in terms of controversial topic that um, is a bit of a no burger, in my opinion, is this link between great earthquakes and triggering eruptions. Um, th there is not much evidence for it, but we come back to it again and again and again to try and examine it more. Um, so, so I guess that's controversial, but probably most people don't see much evidence for it. Um, then, I don't know, volcanologists, if you have 10 volcanologists, you'll have 11 controversies. So, it's, 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 uh, probably the biggest controversy is who should get the money to do what they want to do <laughs> from the money shop. <laughs> so, with that, can we say thank you to Adam? Thank you. Everybody have fun tonight. Thank you. See you next week. Yeah. Scarlett, any questions on the